This is Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast. And joining me today, we have John Lee, the CEO and Executive Chairman of the Flying Nickel Mining Company. Welcome aboard, John. Thank you, Michael. Good to be on your show. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, I'm a my I'm a Manitoba boy, and I'm very familiar with the Thompson Nickel Belt, where you guys are. Uh, but for the uh, sake of my listeners who may not be uh, familiar with the Flying Nickel Mining Company, um, let's give them the uh, 20,000 foot uh, elevator pitch on who the company is. Yeah, I think first of all, Michael, have, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Flying Nickel. The company went public just a year ago. And I have over 20 years of experience in the mining industry, the first 10 years as a investor. And I was doing pretty well until 2011. After sort of recovery of the uh, financial crisis, I thought it was kind of, it'd be fun to run a, a junior mining company as a hobby that started out and it turned into a 13 year uh, double full time <laughs> job <laughs> to where we are today. Uh, we have raised over $150 million in the market myself for junior companies. And my specialization, uh, Michael, is nickel. I've followed the nickel market for the last 15 years and acquired several nickel projects. I had, you know, many years ago in Yukon, in in um, in Manitoba, in Sudbury. In particularly, my my favorite was this Minago project, which I uh, I was able to fortunate to acquire in 2021 and then went public in 2022. And the reason is Minago is the, the Thompson Nickel Belt, as you have said. And uh, Thompson Nickel Belt is the North, is the second largest uh, nickel camp in North America with 5 billion pounds of historical nickel production, only second to Sudbury, uh, and is actually ahead of uh, Voices Bay. And Minago, the project I liked about it is a couple of reasons. I think first uh, is an open pit optimized re, uh, project with the resource of a billion pounds of nickel in the ground, grading at 0.74% nickel. And really quickly, Michael, 0.74% nickel open pit optimized in North America used to be the norm 10 years ago. But because of lack of investment in the nickel mining, that the current nickel head grades of open pit project in North America, Canada, is around 0.4. And that number is ex expected to drop to below 0.25 by 2028. So that really put Minaco already today above and beyond its peers in terms of grades. And that will be three times tripling the grades of other mine, uh, mines that are nickel that are open pit by 2028. And then the other couple of things I like about Minago is that, as, as you know, a Thompson is 99% hydropowered. So if you're talking about the green mandate and care about climate change and having these batteries go into electric vehicles, there's no better, uh, there's no better source for nickel than nickel coming out of Manitoba. Potentially, Minago wants to get into production to be the lowest carbon footprint nickel operation in the world. And that will be ideally suited for electric vehicles. So first of all, you know, it's highest, it's high grade, it's open pit. Secondly, it's green. And then third is the project has over $40 million investment put into it, including a historical feasibility study, 80,000 meters of drilling. And we're on the verge of getting this project permitted. We already received the green light for, from the First Nation of which we're going to talk about a bit later, but the Manitoba government, given that we have already received the blessing from the First Nations, is going to expedite the review of the issuance of the Environmental Act license. And that is the final piece of paper permit that we need to uh, make a construction decision and break, the, and break the grounds of this very exceptional, unique project, Michael. That's uh, definitely an exciting time for your company. Now, there's been other operators on this property. How did... Uh... How did it evolve to uh, get to the point where it came into your company's hands? Yeah, you know, Michael, if you've been around the industry for more than a couple of decades as I have, I personally invested in maybe over 50, maybe close to 100 junior companies. As I mentioned to you, my first decade of my uh, career was investing in, in the mining, junior mining space. Everything's all about timing. And uh, the company does not generate, generate cash. It's an exploration development stage company. So it has to re rely on the capital market to uh, to continue its its uh, to continue its uh, um, uh, to continue its operation. Unfortunately, Michael, because of the lack of invest, because the silver, because nickel, uh, nickel prices has been in the consolidation do doldrum for more than fifteen years, and uh, been oscillating between four dollars a pound and twelve dollars a pound, and you really need about fifteen dollars a pound to make it go at it. So there, there wasn't a lot of money or investment being poured into 
of the nickel, the of the nickel junior market. So the project Minago was discovered actually back in the late eight, 1980s. It's been through six different operators, and uh, you know it's just a matter of uh, the uh, the CEO weren't able to finance the company. There weren't enough skin in the game, and now we were very very fortunate to have grabbed this project. Uh, we paid 15 million dollar in 20 in uh, in uh, 2021. And then the market cap went to 100 in 2022. And funny enough, Michael, we're back to $15 million. That just show you the volatility of, uh, of, of upside and the, and, the, and the risks associated with the mining company. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of hearts broken. A lot of uh, shares got cleaned. And uh, crisis came opportunity. And we are very, like, I was so extremely happy to acquire this project. I outbidded everybody, literally, uh, on the fly and uh, still pitching myself to this day that we're only operating this project, Michael. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, if you've been in the mining industry, I've been uh, doing this now for 21 years. You see a lot of tears uh, over those times and, uh, yes. and, and dreams dashed, but it's, you know, right project, right place at the right time can, uh, can do a lot of wonderful things. Now, you guys are still drilling the project. You guys have had some really... Uh, exceptional drill results in your last uh, round of assays. Can you tell me about those? Right. Um, the the project was well advanced, as I mentioned, with $40 million and uh, close to 80, 86,000 meters drilling. So we don't really need to drill, even though there's a lot of exploration potential, but the billion pound of nickel in the ground is already at a feasibility stage in terms of drill density. Uh, what happened, Michael, was last year as we as we proceeded to develop the project and update the feasibility study and did a round of maiden drilling for black nickel itself since we acquired it, we noticed that there's a lot of PGM, platinum palladium assays, came out of the ground of our drill holes. So we're scratching our back and our heads as to what the hell happened because there weren't a lot of references to PGM for Minago. Minago is not known for its PGM. It's only mostly known for its nickel. So it turned out that as we reviewed the database, of all the historical historical drill holes, that only 20% of the drill holes were assay for PGM. Maybe because uh, nickel prices were high in 20, 2011, 2010, when nickel was 20, and uh, the operator was busy developing, uh, putting a nickel mine into production, or maybe because uh, you know even earlier, it was before the advent of catalytic converters, that there were really not, not a lot of emphasis in the late 80s in, in platinum and palladium. Whatever the reasons, it is a big void of which this is, it could, it, it could be a very significant byproduct. So what we're doing now is we're not drilling per se, but rather we are analyzing the, the drill database and going into the core shack and taking out representative sample uh, cores uh, that had not been assayed for PGN and we're assaying for PGN. So we're taking out about 10% of the past um, uh, cores, around 7,000 meters to assay for PGM in conjunction with the, another sort of 20% that had already been asset for PGM. All, all in ourselves, we're pretty confident of coming up with a maiden platinum palladium resource to complement and to complete the feasibility study to make sure that is reflective of the project's true potential. That's, uh, that's definitely wonderful news. It's always good when you can uh, find more value out of the same drills. It's a lot cheaper to, than having to drill new holes. So. That's fantastic. And again, both both of those items, those are green energy tech items. And there was a, yes. a reference on your website that I really liked when you were talking about how this was going to power the new green economy. I believe the figure was there was enough nickel in your mind to create, was it 10 million Teslas? Enough to uh, in, enough to go into 10 million batteries of Tesla threes. So that so our mind is enough to fill about three years with the Tesla production today. That's a big win, especially as uh, this the movement towards uh, more electric vehicles on the road uh, come because you know you and I both know that the uh, the biggest roadblock there is getting the uh, the minerals for these batteries. Just real quick on that. Um, nickel has been nickel is the standards for high performance ev batteries and that's why elon musk four years five years ago talked about mining as much nickel and uh, and if you can mine nickel responsibly uh, elon is going to give you a giant fat contract 
And since then, you have you have the Volkswagen, you have uh, Porsche, um, and uh, and and several different manufacturers that have standardized on what they call the MNC11. Then that's nickel, manganese, and uh, and cobalt, with, uh, which nickel is eighty percent of the battery's cathode. This trend is going to continue for at least next ten years. How do we know? We've been talking to several auto manufacturers who share their roadmaps with us, and uh, they're they're looking for nickel supply from 2030 to 2035. So nickel is here to stay. And it's not just sort of fundamental uh, optics. If you look at what happened to the nickel price last year, this time last year, Michael, nickel emphatically broke out of that consolidation, that kilo consolidation between five to $10. It, as once it broke out of $10, it went to $50. <laughs> but subsequently had to retrace its gain back to around now, right now it's around 11, which makes an ideal entry point. Because what used to be a insurmountable resistance now is a very strong technical support, and from here on, we see a lot of upset on nickel. You've seen some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, Trapigora uh, encountered seven hundred fifty million dollar fraud when when they thought they bought nickel, it turned out to be bags of sands. So there are very strong indications that the fundamentals for nickel is only going to become more bullish as time goes on, and that and that uh, and that uh, the technical trends also indicated so. And on a conservative basis of EV penetration to 30 to 40% three years to four years from now, it's going to spell double the amount of nickel demand in the market. And right now, nickel year to year uh, production is down, not up. So, Michael, we are up all the metals out there besides the precious metals. I am most bullish of nickel over all the base metals. Yeah, well, nickel goes into a lot of the screen technology and we're in deficit already and is more and more of the green technical technology comes online, that deficit is only going to grow uh, unless we come on with projects like yours. So um, ESG is also becoming a, a crucial uh, part of the equation for mining companies. Now you've addressed the environmental uh, arm of the ESG with uh, the fact that you're located in the Thompson Nickel Belt where all the electric power is hydroelectric and you're going to have the uh, one of the greenest mines on the planet that will be, uh, you know, developing the nickel. Um, but tell me more about your relationship with the Norway House Cree, uh, because the social buy-in is also crucial to um, banks and large institutional funders funding formulas with ESG. Michael, we put we put very strong emphasis on ESG. It's not only because it's required, but it's it's good business practice and it spells for longevity of our operation. ESG spells for environmental, social, and governance. From an environmental standpoint, the project is hydropowered. It is, it is a sulfide project. It's not laterite. It doesn't have acidic draining uh, tailings like the, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to be heated. It's a very conventional flotation device. It's as friendly, environmentally friendly as, as it could be. In terms of social governance, um, you know, we have a very we have fostered in the in the just just the last two years a very strong uh, bond with the Norway House Cree Nation. Minago's um, Minago's claims are entirely sitting on the exclusive uh, uh, First Nations uh, exclusive uh, 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 national territory of of, of, of um, Norway House. I met with the Norway House Chief Anderson uh, in September. We toured their community. It's it's one of the top ten. Uh, First Nation community in in uh, in all of Canada. It's a very innovative, very hardworking First Nations group, and we're very fortunate to be working with the group that is very forward looking and to create additional job opportunities. At the same time, uh, looking to reshape uh, and uh, the the and then helping with the climate change. And last but not least is governance. Uh, the company also plays very important emphasis on governance. So. For example, a Free Nation will be, have the right to nominate a director on, on the Fly Nickel Board. And the company is working uh, hand in hand with the government of Manitoba from the environmental, from technical, and also from social aspects to make sure that we, uh, we are in full compliance with the rules and regulations and all the ESG requirements. Um, we're going to be, I mean, Michael, before said and done, this is going to be the most forefront ESG compliant nickel mining company in the world, given that Canada is one of the most uh, ESG sort of advanced countries in the world. Yeah, win-win, definitely. Uh, our mining practices are being adopted all over the world. Uh, 
uh, because we are good at what we do. So um, what's the future prospects for the company? What's coming up in the next 12 months as far as uh, activity? Oh, Michael, sometimes uh, we, we sometimes if you don't do anything, the stock goes crazy, right? Like it was this time last year. <laughs> we're high buying. Stock is $1.40. And now we're trading at 14 cents, a 10. Uh, the, current, the current valuation is 20% of the money that had gone into the project. It is uh, lower than Flying had acquired the project for two years ago. And um, and uh, it's trading at uh, one point. What is trading at uh, something like uh, less than two cents a pound of nickel in the ground. We're very excited about the future prospect, even though um, if the share price is not reflective of that, but we're, we're going to be very patient. We believe the pension is going to swim the other way, swing the other way. But in short, uh, the construction decision, we believe is going to be rendered by this time of next year. So all the permits, government, uh, all the different various different permits will be um, we're looking to have them uh, acquired by this time next year. Uh, the project feasibility study will be completed by incorporating the PGM element to that, which is going to be just additional byproduct credit that will enhance the economics of the project. And uh, and then uh, we're looking to commission this might to be possibly the greenest project uh, in, in, in all over the world for nickel. And the company's in very active discussion with more than half a dozen strategic players from battery manufacturers to auto manufacturers, uh, strategic off-takers. So, I mean, there's a lot of happening uh, um, beneath the surface. Uh, we're going to com complete our PGM assay program, and we've got about three more batches of uh, PGM assays to come. If nothing else, uh, you, the uh, shareholders in the weeks to come would expect additional sets of uh, very exciting PGM assays uh, that is gonna, that's going to be disclosed, and that's going to be shared with the investment community and remind the investment community of the glories uh, the project has been through, and that this 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 company is very committed and serious about bringing this project uh, to uh, to to its rightful uh, conclusion, which is which is production for for the decades and generations to come. Michael, uh, that's a wonderful thing. It's great to hear projects that uh, have a clear path to being greenlit and to. Uh, to be so uh, environmentally sensitive with good social buy-in. So this sounds like a winner. Is there anything else that I that the listeners should know about the company that we didn't cover? Uh, look us up, Michael, the flynickel.com. We're trading on uh, FLYN Flynn, over-the-counter FLYNF. Um, in terms of our share structure, right now there are about 70 million shares outstanding trading at around 18 cents, so just under $15 million Canadian market cap. Um, we have a very strong institution support by the name of Blackstone, and they're a nickel developer in Vietnam, and also Sparta Institution from Germany. They each own around 10% on, on a partially diluted basis. And we have also other institutions and insiders collectively own over half of the, over half of the, uh, of the uh, share structure. The company raised uh, just over a million dollars, just close to a million dollars only last, last month. So we are fully funded to complete our uh, PGM programs and then um, and potentially towards the end of the year to making a construction decision. So I uh, highly recommend you, uh, your audience check us out, especially if you're into energy metals and nickel and, and looking for a way to uh, gain leverage to the uh, inevitables of adaptation of the EV revolution that's coming. Perfect. If they have any specific questions to uh, ask you, how would they get a hold of you? You can Twitter me at John Lee, uh, Fly Nickel or John Lee Silver Elephant. So I'm pretty active on Twitter. Or uh, just uh, send me an email at jlee -E at flynickel.com. Wonderful. Thanks very much for joining me, John. And I look forward to uh, seeing how this project rolls out. Hey, terrific. Thank you for your time. Let's talk again soon. You bet. Flying Nickel Mining Company is a paid sponsor of the Prospector News. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.